Good evening. Good to see everyone. Glad you guys can make it. Um, I just to recap what we've covered so far. We uh, started with George McDonald and uh, his idea of the imagination and the analogies he sees in nature specifically. Uh, then we did Chesterton and uh, his uh, sort of play of reason against the imagination, but the way that the two have to be balanced and work together. And then last week I gave Lewis two weeks because there's just so much to say. I could have done six weeks on Lewis, but uh, you know, tried to to narrow it down and. So last week we did more of Lewis's nonfiction, and um, this week we're going to focus uh, specifically on the Narnia stories, which I'm really excited about. I did, just being the philosopher that I am, sneak in a little bit to this lecture, some stuff from a, a few of his other essays, uh, just because I discovered these in the process of uh, preparing for this, and I highly recommend uh, this collection of short essays, just called On Stories, and he has just sort of various uh, various small essays, uh, several on different inklings, so one on uh, Tolkien, one on uh, Charles Williams, one on Dorothy Sayers, um, but also uh, what he thinks a fairy tale is, why he thinks it's important uh, for adults as well as children, and uh, sort of also how he wrote as um, his, his fiction, what uh, the process of writing it was. So. Um, Let's actually start with that. And uh, something that's just really interesting that I learned uh, just maybe an hour before coming is that yesterday, as of yesterday, um, it was the 85th anniversary of uh, C.S. Lewis's conversion, um, of, of the night that he talked with Tolkien about uh, myth and myth became fact and uh, converted to Christianity. So uh, it's, um, it's appropriate that we're talking about him tonight. So uh, look at your first quote on the handout. And this sort of will uh, take us into this discussion of what fairy tales are and why he thinks they're important. He says in an essay called On Three Ways of Writing for Children, when I was 10, I read fairy tales in secret and would have been ashamed if I had been found doing so. Now that I am 50, I read them openly. When I became a man, I put away childish things, including the fear of childishness and the desire to be very grown up. So Lewis actually thinks of children's literature as a genre that does not actually mean literature to be read by only children. He thinks that it's a genre that, uh, it, that appeals to children and isn't excluding them, in a sense. But he actually, uh, he, he actually in his own life, uh, did not read a lot of, uh, he says, he missed out on a lot of children's literature as a child and read a lot of grown-up books as a child and uh, encountered like Wind in the Willows and some of these other famous children's, um, Beatrix Potter in his 20s, um, way, way later. And uh, he says, though, that uh, he enjoyed them just as much, uh, he, he thinks, as he would as a child. And some of the ones that he read again as an adult, he thinks he, he got even more out of them as an adult than he did as a child. Um, he says, because he was putting so much more into them. Uh, so he wants to argue that even though the Narnia books uh, are written for children, they are appropriate for adults uh, as well and um, can even be enjoyed at sort of varying levels of depth. Um, and I'm actually finding that as a parent to be true. I'm currently, you can see our copy is tattered uh, and even, even with all the tape is about to fall apart and my daughters and I are going through the the Narnia book for our second time. We're about halfway through, and uh, I, I still just uh, as I know they're getting things at one level, um, and even the two daughters are understanding it at different levels. I have a seven-year-old and a ten-year-old, and the ten-year-old is understanding this time around the analogies to Christ. The seven-year-old is not. She just is enjoying the story, uh, and then I'm I'm sort of enjoying all these things that sort of make me see what what it means to become a stronger believer um, and to have your imagination opened up and, and even things about faith, hope, and love. So it's, uh, it's a book that rewards rereadings. And um, C.S. Lewis, he actually does define the imagination and separates it into three types. 
and he does that so that he can explain what type he thinks that he's doing and the first one he refers to um, as a kind of reverie or daydream And uh, he says this, this is the type, uh, this kind of imagination is one of wish fulfillment. So it's primarily thinking, what do I wish I was? I'm going to think of stories in which I am that thing that I wish I was. Um, he says that uh, a lot of realistic uh, sort of school level um, novels have children, um, you know, standing up to the bullies and uh, coming out on top. And he says that there's something about um, the imagination, sort of adolescent wanting your cut, cut he says, cutting a fine figure, um, being able to say the right thing back to the person that had said something clever to you. Um, he thinks that this is the lowest level of using the imagination and actually the one that if the fantasy that you're writing uh, is equal to this that that it's severely lacking. He says that the second type of imagination is uh, the kind that invents and that's the kind that he describes his own uh, his own sort of development as doing. He says that when he was really young, uh, half of the time his imagination would go into this sort of wish fulfillment uh, sort of thing. And he says the other, the other half of his imaginative life was spent inve inventing characters, uh, narratives, plots. He um, had a whole thing he called Animal Land. And it was lots of different talking animals that each had their own personalities. And, uh, and he says that he didn't have a goal um, for I want to teach this through this story that uh, he said it was more like bird watching so he would just be sitting and an image would sort of uh, come into his mind uh, so a fawn carrying an umbrella you know or uh, a white witch um, you know driving a sleigh and slowly as these things came into his mind they would start to sort of circle around one another and eventually sort of fall into a story uh, and that's when he would uh, he almost said he had this longing um, that was bubbling over and outside of him that he couldn't uh, stop or, or really do anything until he wrote it down and made it a story so he says this is what for him uh, the Narnia books are he says uh, one day I said to myself, let's try to make a story about that, uh, as, as he was sort of thinking of those pictures in his head. The third type of imagination is what we discussed last week, and um, that is the kind that uh, creates what he calls joy. And uh, if you remember from last week, joy is uh, it's a kind of poetic, uh, organic, and intuitive power. So, um, poetic, intuitive, and it's, it's an ability to see beyond, uh, beyond what's in front of you to sort of spiritual reality. Um, and, and so, as opposed to imagination uh, in the sense of thinking of images, uh, this type of imagination is one that can move from uh, the material sort of reality around you to something spiritual and eternal and immaterial. Uh, and he says that uh, it conveys intense feeling, um, makes a powerful impression, uh, does what it's going to do not through saying but through showing. So it doesn't state that certain things are the case, but it shows or suggests that they are, sort of hints at them. Um, it, it's meant to awaken something within you and not sort of pour, just pour something into you. Uh, and he says it creates a, a desire that is painful, but it's a longing that and a painful thing that you want to have uh, because, because there's uh, the sense that you're being you're you're being given this hint of the greatest thing that you were made for. So uh, these are the three types of imagination. He thinks that they're sort of increasing in uh, quality as you go on. And it's, it's humble of him that he gives himself the second one and not the third. Um, but he's, he says, like, that's, that's as much as I was able to do, whether it does end up doing this third thing um, that's sort of up to my readers uh, to say. So um, 
why a children's story or a fairy tale? Um, he says that some things are best said in the art form of a children's story. And he says Narnia is that. He says, just as a composer might write a dead march, not because there was a public funeral in view, but because certain musical ideas that had occurred to him went best into that form. Um, so also, were his ideas about Narnia best presented in the form of a, ch a story for children? Uh, so it, he says it wasn't, as in, he says in the case of uh, Tolkien, and uh, several of the other children's writers, they knew particular children. George MacDonald is this way too, and they and they wrote stories for those children that they knew and that they loved. And that's how uh, that's what when they called it a children's story, that's what came into being. For him, he didn't actually know any particular children. It was that the content that he thought of seemed to fit the form of a children's story the best, um, which I think is really interesting. And it, and it wasn't again something that would exclude the adult but it was something that would not exclude the child. So um, he says, a children's story, and I love this one, uh, this quote, a children's story which is enjoyed only by children is a bad children's story. The good ones last. Um, he says, I now enjoy the fairy tales better than I did in childhood. Being now able to put more in, of course, I get more out. Um, those of us who are blamed when old for reading childish books were blamed when children for reading books too old for us. No reader worth his salt trots along in obedience to a timetable. So, so he thinks that this uh, children's genre fairy tale, again, has nothing to do with age. Uh, it has to do with a particular way of seeing the world that he's kind of trying to recapture. And I guess I did want to stop and ask you all, what, if he's saying that there's a particular idea that fits the form of a children's tale the best, um, what is it that's unique about a children's story? A any, any thoughts on that? What, what makes something uniquely a children's story and not, I don't know, a fairy tale for grown-ups or something? Well, uh, the vocabulary needs to be age-appropriate. Okay, so there's a simplicity of style. Yeah. Um, he mentions that, that the simplicity of style, the n having to say, like, in certain ways, complex things in simple words, he, he wanted that challenge and actually thought that there's something about the story of Narnia that is allowing the um, weak and the, um, what is it, uh, meek in spirit, uh, poor in spirit, to see something grand. And so there's something about the simplicity of a children's story uh, delivering something grand that uh, he thinks sort of accords with the gospel. Um, narrative. Any other any other thoughts about a children's story? It usually includes children. Okay. Or yeah, children as characters. characters. Yeah, yeah. In all of the Narnia tales, there's seven of them. Um, they are, have children as sort of the main characters, and all but the horse and his boy are their children from the real world that somehow get into the Narnia world and explore and are given a task by Aslan um, to form some sort of redemption uh, to that world. So, yeah. That many children's stories have like an element of mischief that's neither good nor evil. Hmm. But the, I think the kids are allowed to be a little bit more complex than the adults because you know Edmund isn't a villain, but yeah, he gets so they're still working out good and bad. Right, they're not condemned for it. Right. Uh, that, but I mean, when children are depicted, right? Stories. So they're sort of experimenting with evil and goodness uh, instead of it being this hard, hard-formed component of their character. That's really good. Yeah, I think I think that's true for him. So. Um, he says that he, he does sort of address uh, criticisms of fantasy. Um, he says some people will claim that fantasy stories give children a false impression of the world um, that they live in and is serves as mere escapism, um, teaches children to retreat into a world of wish fulfillment. And uh, in response to that, he says, well, it, it does satisfy um, wishes. It does sort of create and satisfy uh, wishes, but um, in and this is, this is just a quote that I loved and I wanted to include it. He says that there's two types of longings, um, and this is not the one on the handout, but um, two types of longings that can uh, arise in a children's story. Um, one being a children's story that's a realistic no novel. He says, imagine a realistic novel about the school-aged children. Uh, and the other, imagine a story like Narnia where the person escapes into another world and sort of fights dragons and does all these things. So he says, 
There is no doubt that both arouse and imaginatively satisfy wishes. We long to go through the looking glass to reach fairyland. We also long to be the immensely popular and successful schoolboy or school girl, school girl, or the lucky boy or girl who discovers the spy's plot or rides the horse that none of the cowboys can manage. But the two longings are very different. The second, especially when directed on something so close as school life, is ravenous and deadly serious. Its fulfillment on the level of imagination is in very truth compensatory. We run to it from the disappointments and humiliations of the real world. It sends us back to the real world undividedly discontented, for it is all flattery to the ego. The pleasure consists in picturing oneself the object of admiration. So. In this, he's describing this type of imagination, the realistic school sort of novel. Um, the, the other longing, that for fairyland, is very different. In a sense, a child does not long for fairyland as a boy longs to be a hero of the 11th grade. Does anyone suppose that he really and prosaically longs for all the dangers and discomforts of a fairy tale? really wants dragons in contemporary England? It is not so. It would be much truer to say that Fairyland arouses a longing for he knows not what. It stirs and troubles him to his lifelong enrichment with the dim sense of something beyond his reach. And far from dulling or emptying the actual world, gives it a new dimension of depth. He does not despise real woods because he has read of enchanted woods. The reading makes all real woods a little enchanted. This is a special kind of longing. The boy reading the school story of the type I have in mind desires success and is unhappy once the book is over because he can't get it. The boy reading the fairy tale desires and is happy in the very fact of desiring. For his mind has not been concentrated on himself as it often is in the more realistic story. I do not mean that school stories for boys and girls ought not to be written. I am only saying that they are far more liable to become fantasies in the clinical sense than fantastic stories are. One longing is a spiritual exercise and the other is a disease. So very strong words, very strong distinction for him to make um, actually in an age where the realistic, the sort of grim realistic novel is the thing. Um, that, that is sort of the major genre of literature for the 20th century and I would definitely say even the books I was made to read as a public school child were um, grim realism, often uh, sort of survival tales, you're out there on your own and somehow you have to figure out a way to survive and make it. Um, and, and the main character usually is a hero. Um, and so uh, it, it does possibly, it, it, it may possibly be that he has something going here in this distinction. Um, but he definitely thinks that these fairy tales are not mere escapism, that they actually re-enchant the world around us uh, and make there, there be something fuller uh, than something less. So, um, okay, so going to this next quote, um, he says, I thought I saw how stories of this kind could steal past a certain inhibition which had paralyzed much of my own religion in childhood. Why did one find it so hard to feel as one was told one ought to feel about God or the sufferings of Christ? I thought the chief reason was that one was told one ought to. An obligation to feel can freeze feelings, and reverence itself did harm. The whole subject was associated with lowered voices, almost as if it were something ma medical. But supposing that by casting all these things into an imaginary world, stripping them of their stained glass and Sunday school associations, one could make them for the first time appear in their real potency. Could one not thus steal past those watchful dragons? I thought one could. So the idea here is that, and, and I remember feeling this. I remember when I was uh, seven or eight, I told my dad that I thought heaven would be a really boring place. Um, I'm really embarrassed to say that, but I just thought, okay, you worship God all day, uh, and uh, what, what, how, where's the fun in that? Like, that's going to get old after an hour, you know? Um, I get tired at church, so... Um, and, uh, and, and then sort of these times where I would see my dad in um, full-fledged full worship um, at church, um, I could see it in his face and his eyes, um, and just in the posture, and I, I would be hearing the word and not be feeling uh, those same feelings um, and, and sort of just be wondering
wondering what's wrong with me. Um, why, why can I not feel that kind of reaction to the things that, um, that he's seeing? And it wasn't that I thought spirituality equals feelings. It's that he saw something more uh, than I could see. I, I wasn't seeing everything. Um, and so what Lewis says is that if that experience happens to a child over and over and over again, they just, they're very tempted to kind of give up on religion. Um, just to think like, obviously this isn't for me. I never feel the, ty the type of deep feelings that, uh, that everyone else does. I think heaven is boring. Um, I have more fun under the sunshine playing a sport, you know, than I do at church. And, and so he says that the, uh, the fairy tale is actually meant to introduce the child to stories that are in certain ways similar to um, Bible stories, but very different. That you know, they have animals, they have dwarves, they have giants, they have all these other things. And so you're not, you're, you're sort of um, the figure in your head that says, you should feel this about this as you're reading. It, it isn't actually talking to you, you're just sort of engaging in a story and having fun. And he says, uh, he actually told parents, don't tell your children that Aslan could be Jesus. Um, as, as they're reading. Like, do, do not let them know that that's meant to be the case because what he wanted was them to have an actual experience with a lion um, and, and this emotional sort of experience that uh, finds a lion that's both good and strong and all-powerful and uh, omniscient, omnipresent, and l learn to love that thing. Um, and it actually sets about making the sort of soil of their hearts ready to receive the gospel um, when they're ready. And so that's why he says uh, you could sneak past those watchful dragons. The watchful dra dragons being the voices that say you should feel this right now or else you're not a good Christian. Um, and I love that. And I actually, yesterday I was reading a scene from Narnia to my daughters and there's a scene where uh, one of the characters uh, has to put a thorn into uh, Aslan's paw, uh, and it's in order for this redemptive thing to happen to another character. And um, and Annalise uh, said, you know, well, why? And that's going to hurt him. Um, and uh, and Claire was like, well, it's just like Jesus. Um, and and Annalise is like, I don't understand. I was like, Claire, don't worry. Like she doesn't need to understand that part yet. Um, she, and, and, and so we sort of set that aside for a second and we just said like the poor lion and he loves this child so much that he's willing to do this for her. And, um, and when she's Claire's age, like the, the thing that Lewis is saying is that her mind will already be ready, sort of shaped to receive those kinds of emotions because it's been bred in these fairy tales that that teach that these types of things can happen. Um, and, and they've had the emotional reaction that then can happen when they encounter the real thing in Christ. Um, so he says, uh, Lewis says, a young man who wishes to remain a sound atheist cannot be too careful of his reading. There are traps everywhere. God is, if I may say it, very unscrupulous. Um, and so stories which hint at or skirt around the edges of the gospel prepare the reader's soul, making it good soil so the seed of the gospel can be sown, grown, and harvested in the future. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I just I just love this, and I've seen I've seen this happen um, in my children. I think it happened to me. Uh, I I got I think I responded emotionally to Narnia before I really responded emotionally to the gospel. Um, and, and that what it it would have done then is like baptize my imagination, make it make it ready to receive those things. So, um, questions before we keep going, and we we go to the Narnia stories themselves, or comments. Okay. All right. So Narnia, raise your hand if you have read all seven. Awesome. Raise your hand if you've read at least one. Okay. Okay. So raise your hand if you've not read any. Okay. Well, you have an adventure ahead of you um, because they, they're a must read before you die.
sort of scenario. Um, there are seven of the novels. Um, 100 million copies were sold in uh, 47 languages. They were published in London between 1950 and 1956. And um, it's set in this realm called Narnia, just for you guys that haven't read it. Um, a world of magic, mythical beasts, and talking animals. Um, and various children have adventures and they play central roles. And it shows the unfolding of the history of the world from the very beginning of its creation to its its end uh, at the end um, and uh, the books yeah the books span the entire history of Narnia so um, look at your handout and uh, the the first thing that I want to talk about um, is the way that uh, one of the characters especially Lucy who honestly I didn't like her at first when I first read the stories. I thought she was too good. She just is kind of a goody two-shoes. Um, she always did the right thing, always was happy about life, and I was like, I get upset at people, and I, you know, I'm more like Edmund, um, who betrays Aslan and, and all those sorts of things. Um, it's really interesting just the story that Lucy has had with me personally. I think that every year of my life, I love her more. Um, and, and appreciate her more. Um, but I think that what she does represent is sort of the answer to this question, which is what does a life look like that is just ready to have a real imagination? Um, what, what would our lives look like if we prepared them to receive the best things that there are to offer? Uh, so let's just look at this passage. This is where she encounters the wardrobe for the first time. Um, it says, uh, after sh and shortly after they looked into a room that was quite empty except for one big wardrobe, the sort that has a looking glass in the door, there was nothing else in the room at all except a dead blue bottle on the windowsill. Nothing there, said Peter, and they all trooped out again, all except Lucy. She stayed behind because she thought it would be worthwhile trying the door of the wardrobe, even though she felt almost sure that it would be locked. To her surprise, it opened quite easily, and two mothballs dropped out. She took a step further in, then two or three steps, always expecting to feel woodwork against the tips of her fingers, but she could not feel it. Next moment, she found that what was rubbing against her face and hands was no longer soft fur, but something hard and rough and even prickly. Why, it is just like branches of a tree, exclaimed Lucy. And then she saw that there was a light ahead of her, not a few inches away, where the back of the wardrobe ought to have been, but a long way off. Something cold and soft was falling on her. A moment later, she found that she was standing in the middle of a wood at nighttime, with snow under her feet and snowflakes falling through the air. Lucy felt a little frightened, but she felt very inquisitive and excited as well. She began to walk forward, crunch, crunch, over the snow and through the wood towards the other light. In about 10 minutes, she reached it and found it was a lamppost. So uh, this is sort of the, uh, one of the sort of defining moments, uh, I think, of the Narnia tale, um, her first entering uh, the land of Narnia. And I think it's worth asking why Lucy is the one that encounters it first. Uh, what, what type of person is she uh, that makes her the first one to sort of stumble upon it? Um, and I think that there, there's a few things about her personality that I think are worth noting that are worth even thinking of how to emulate them um, in our own lives. And I'm a very melancholic person, so Lucy's like an opposite to me in certain ways, uh, but I, I admire her. So um, a few things about her that I, I think sort of can teach us something. She's full of innocent hope. Um, she's actually a foil to Edmund's sort of bitter skepticism. Uh, she's the first to forgive Edmund after he betrays Aslan and betrays them. Um, she's easy to underestimate. Um, I think she's the youngest of the four kids. Uh, she sort of would seem, as far as worldly wise, uh, to be the lowest um, of the totem pole. Um, maybe someone you would think would be easily convinced of something um, that's false, but she, that also 
mean she's easily convinced of something that's true, um, which is interesting. She uh, is brave and she's also curious and I think her curiosity and bravery somewhat go together. Um, as you can see in this, uh, just this one um, section, Peter is, and the rest of the kids are quick to sort of leave the room and see there's nothing there, but she sees there's something there um, and she looks behind those doors and she peers in and she, she even keeps going. It has the phrase further in, uh, which ends up being a, an important uh, phrase later on in the last Narnia story. Um, and then uh, she is given, um, as each of the children are given a weapon uh, to use in fighting, um, she's the only one that's given one only for self-defense uh, and not for, for actual fighting. So she's given a cordial that heals, um, whereas Peter's given a sword, uh, Edmund, he, he's, he gets a sword eventually. Uh, Susan's given a bow and arrow, uh, and they're all they're all sort of uh, they get the things that are a brave warrior could boast of um, in a certain way. She she's the one that is is weak in the in the eyes of the world in a sense for her gift. Um, she has the beatitudes in her character. She has purity of heart, poor in spirit, persecuted for righteousness' sake. This happens over and over again in the stories. Um, she also believes in Aslan's goodness right away when she encounters him. Um, a lot of the other characters are afraid of him at first. Um, so their first in instinct is, this is a lion that could tear me to, to pieces and, and kill me. What am I going to do? Uh, she, she instantly wants to call him her friend um, and, and, and trusts him. Um, the other thing, and this is just something I appreciate being a mother of two daughters, is she's not defined by the man she's in love with, ever, in the Narnia stories. Um, she doesn't have this like intriguing love life that, um, you know, oh, if Lucy will only fall in love with this person and then she'll be happy forever. That's just not, not that that's a bad thing, but that's not the thing that's defining her. Um, she, she's kind of actually a tomboy to a certain extent and um, good in battle and sought after by many men it, so, it says but um, she has her eyes on Aslan um, so I think uh, I think all of those things sort of point uh, to something about Lucy that is, is worth sort of thinking about does my life reflect any of those things um, and, and all those things I think are things to be embarrassed of in the face of the secular world, but, but in the Christian world, something to, um, to strive for. So uh, the other quote um, that we have from Lucy, and I don't know if, yeah, it is on here, from Prince Caspian. Lucy woke out of the deepest sleep you can imagine with a feeling that the voice she liked best in the world had been calling her name. Um, so another, another thing about Lucy is that uh, she, she listens she's always her ears are always open to something that is um, calling her from beyond herself and um, she she notices she's likely to notice miracles when they happen because she's looking for them um, and so just the fact that uh, she wakes from a deep sleep and she can imagine um, a voice calling her name this is sort of typical of, of the type of way that she postures herself um, in, in the world so um, moving on to the darker side of the imagination for the Narnia books in the maybe slightly uh, entertaining side. Um, Lewis seems to have two types of uh, elusive um, characters that are have the illusion of being ready to have a Christian imagination. Um, and, uh, and one, uh, and, that, and that are sort of deafened also um, to, to its call. So um, one type uh, that I think he uh, gets on about is a pragmatic, practical type. Um, this might be the, the kind of thing that uh, John was describing when he said the imagination makes us uneasy, is that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't sound practical. Uh, it doesn't seem like something you can uh, have sort of uh, any kind of clear produce uh, that springs from it. So uh, looking at this quote, uh, this describes Eustace very well. So uh, there was a boy called Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. 
He didn't call his father and mother father and mother, but Harold and Alberta. They were very up-to-date and advanced people. They were vegetarians, non-smokers, and teetotalers, and wore a special kind of underclothes. Eustace Clarence liked animals, especially beetles, if they were dead and pinned on a cart. He liked books if they were books of information and had pictures of grain, grain elevators or of fat foreign children doing exercises in model schools. So, uh, so this is this is a type uh, that Lewis portrays uh, humorously uh, in in several of his books. Eustace is is one of the characters that comes around to actually have a Christian imagination be part of the Narnia world, but um, but starts out very much opposed to it um, because he's being raised in an extremely practical, enlightened kind of world, and uh, and, and that practical, enlightened world has this illusion of of seeing far more uh, than the rest of of uh, people because uh, it thinks of things practically. There's actually another quote that I wanted to read you. This is from The Horse and His Boy about the main character who is in this other land uh, away from Narnia and uh, he's actually, he floated away from it as a, as a baby um, and he sort of has been adopted by this fisherman and um, he always has this longing for a homeland that he doesn't quite know what to do with but he's constantly being told by this father who's somewhat abusive, I think, uh, that he needs to think about more practical things. So uh, it says, he was very interested in everything that lay to the north because no one ever went that way and he was never allowed to go there himself. When he was sitting out of doors mending the nets and all alone, he would often look eagerly to the north. One could see nothing but a grassy slope running up to a level ridge and beyond that the sky with perhaps a few birds in it. Sometimes, if Arshish was there, Shasta would say, Oh, my father, what is there beyond that hill? And then if the fisherman was in a bad temper, he would box Shasta's ears and tell him to attend to his work. Or if he was in a peaceable mood, he would say, Oh, my son, do not allow your mind to be distracted by idle questions. For one of the poets has said, Application to business is the root of prosperity. But those who ask questions that do not concern them are steering the ship of folly towards the rock of indigence. Shasta thought that beyond the hill there must be some delightful secret which his father wished to hide from him. In reality, however, the fisherman talked like this because he didn't know what lay to the north. Neither did he care. He had a very practical mind. So, in the, in the case of Shasta, he has this longing that's, that's deep inside him that's for uh, this, this fuller view of the world. And, uh, and it, it's his adopted father who um, wants to keep him um, from, from ever seeing it because he doesn't understand it. Um, and, and sort of unlike Lucy, who doesn't understand the wardrobe but goes through it anyway, he doesn't understand it so he turns around and goes the other way. Um, so this is kind of a, a, a thing I think that Lewis thinks keeps a person from um, their imagination developing. Um, I've got a question. Yeah, sure. I remember reading a biography on Lewis once that, you know, the, the boy's name is Eustace Clarence Scrub, that he was picking on himself because his name was Clive Staples Lewis. Interesting. And that when yeah. he was four, you know, he told his parents, this is Jack. Hmm. That's how he got the name Jack. But just, just reading this, this introduction, and it makes me think, was he critical of his own childhood because yeah. he didn't t tell stories. So this is kind of autobiographical yeah. in yeah. sense. I mean, his father wa was a little, was kind of stern yep. uh, and kind of distant and uh, and probably would have to a certain extent looked down on his, his animal land and animal stories and certainly at school he would have received uh, the kind of um, instruction that pointed him in a very practical direction. Because he had a tough schoolmaster early on Yeah, too, yeah. I mean I remember when I told, came home from college after my first semester and told my parents I was going to study philosophy. Uh, that was going to be my major. Um, my dad was like, what kind of job can you get with that? <laughs> like that was his, his first. And then my mom was like, are you going to lose your faith in God? And I was like, okay, uh, you know, please, please, don't worry. Um, but but like those those were the things that um, there, there were these practical matters and spiritual matters to consider. And um, and so even, even I experienced a little bit of hesitation towards listening to that longing um, because, because of these warnings that I received from the grown-ups uh, that thought it was it was a bad direction to take um, I'm glad I'm glad I ignored those those warnings so um, 
I remember I said, it's not to my dad. It's not what you can do with philosophy. It's what philosophy does to you as a human being. Um, and I, he didn't have a good answer to that, so. <laughs> I won, I won. Um, okay, so the other, uh, the other false form of the imagination that Lewis talks about is um, kind that is sort of linked with control and possession. Um, one character that we won't go into all the details about why he's this way, but Uncle Andrew <coughs> and, ma and the magician's nephew, he has a, um, he has a sort of, belief in the magic of Narnia or a belief in its uh, possibility, but is, is totally concerned with what he can do with it, what sort of empires he can build with the magic, how he can um, make it do what he wants it to do. Uh, and um, Lewis very like clearly describes the way um, his effort to use the magic to um, sort of harness it to his own control actually deafens his ability to imagine. Um, so on this quote, says, um, but I cannot tell that to this old sinner, and I cannot comfort him either. He has made himself unable to hear my voice. This is Aslan speaking. If I spoke to him, he would hear only growlings and roarings. Oh, Adam's sons, how cleverly you defend yourselves against all that might do you good. But I will give him the only gift he is still able to receive. Um, and he gives them the gift of sleep. He goes to sleep um, temporarily. But uh, there's this quote from McDonald, I couldn't find it uh, in time, but that um, the state of our souls um, is, is like an echo chamber and when uh, the voice of God enters it, that uh, God's character is going to appear to us basically the way the echo chamber of our soul is fashioned. So if the echo chamber of our soul is fashioned in, in a way that is prideful and is self-seeking um, and, and wants to uh, sort of be our own boss um, in the world, then the voice of God is going to be um, really like the roarings that, um, that Uncle Andrew hears. It's going to be something very offensive, very uh, sort of threatening. Um, but if we have the echo chamber of Lucy, um, it's, it's a voice that actually sounds like a, a, the voice of of rescue um, and, and of protection. So um, the other quote is uh, from also from the ma magician's nephew and in that story there's a similar don't eat the fruit from the tree uh, scenario and um, and there's a really tough situation because one of the main characters, his mother it has a life-threatening illness and is about to die and he loves her and really the main thing on his mind is how can I save my mother and he finds that if, or he's told um, by one of the ev more evil characters that if she eats this apple, if he brings it back to her, uh, sh her, her illness will be healed. Um, and, but he's been told by Aslan not to eat the apple. Um, so this is the quote, it says, uh, for the fruit always works, and this is Aslan speaking, it must work, but it does not work happily for any who pluck it at their own will. If any Narnian unbidden had stolen an apple and planted it here to protect Narnia, it would have protected Narnia, but it would have done so by making Narnia into another strong and cruel empire like Charn, not the kindly land I mean it to be. And the witch tempted you to do another thing, my son, did she not? Yes, Aslan, she wanted me to take an apple home to mother. Understand then that that would have healed her, but not to your joy or hers. The day would have come when both you and she would have looked back and said it would have been better to die in that illness. So there's this recurring, uh, this recurring image of uh, these these various characters who are enticed by the magic of Narnia. So they see it. They're not practical and dead into it, but they see it. But their immediate reaction is to want to control it, um, to use it to their own ends, and which is very much like the Ring and the Lord of the Rings. And um, and so this uh, this lesson that uh, that Lewis sort of is, is showing, and I, I don't even I wouldn't even called a lesson. I think it's just a reality that he's depicting is that uh, when this happens, it actually works to their detriment. It's, it's almost like uh, give the person what they want and they'll sort of have to bear the consequences of that if it's, if it's other than what um, God intended them to have. So um, 
so moving from that, uh, those two types, the practical and the possessive uh, controlling types, um, I want to go to just the question, and it's sort of returning to uh, our discussion of Lucy to a certain extent, the question of what is the proper posture of the Christian imagination? Uh, and what I mean by that question is, uh, so when, we, when we're when we in a, in a posture, we're making ourselves ready to receive a certain thing. Um, and I even was told by, uh, when I was taking my class on teaching philosophy, I was told that most students, uh, a lot of students that come in uh, through the first day of class are either sitting up really straight, sort of eager in front of the class, um, and, and you know that they sort of want to know what they're going to have to do, and they're going to be sort of ready to um, try to play, you know, play your game to a certain extent um, and learn or just get good grades. Uh, the good grades kids are a challenge in their own right. Um, or they're sitting with their their hands crossed and sort of slouching in their chair. I don't care. I don't care what you think of me. I'm my own person. Um, and it actually, the, the teacher that taught this to me, she said, those students actually are scared to death. Um, but but they're they're giving you this posture of uh, of confidence um, and of almost apathy, and um, and so there's sort of a way that you approach them, um, and so I think in the same way there's a proper posture that Lewis thinks that we have to have to have the, the sort of proper kind of uh, Christian imagination, and one of the qualities of that posture he's going to say is I'm going to erase this is and this is sort of a um, sort of an opposite to the possessive um, type but one of humility so if you look at our next quote um, this is from Prince Caspian and um, he's offering well I'm just going to read it uh, he's talking to Prince Caspian Welcome, Prince, said Aslan. Do you feel yourself sufficient to take up the kingship of Narnia? I, I don't think I do, sir, said Caspian. I'm only a kid. Good, said Aslan. If you had felt yourself sufficient, it would have been a proof that you were not. Um, so there's this idea that um, a readiness to receive the Christian imagination almost means it, it's, it's not that you lack confidence, but you lack self-confidence in yourself alone um, that uh, you're you're actually entirely aware of all the reasons why you're you may be bound to fail uh, this um, and and in certain ways God Aslan wants us in that in that place so that when we do what we do we know that we're doing it not of our own strength um, and so again this is sort of the opposite of the uncle Andrew who has a confidence in the way he approaches magic. Um, this is one where uh, there's almost a submission, a humility, um, and uh, yeah, a, a giving up of self. Um, the other is um, what I would just call um, a faith that lacks a fear of man. And um, and we have a, a quote from Lu about Lucy that I think uh, shows this. Um, and often in the stories, Lucy can hear or see Aslan when other characters can't. And she actually struggles a lot with them not believing her. Um, when she's seen him and talked to him and he's given her an important message for their task and uh, she delivers that and they think she's just she's just this silly little girl she's seeing things she's hearing things she knows that they think this of her um, and and so anyway this is one of the um, encounters she has with Aslan by herself when the others don't know so um, Lucy Aslan said you have work in hand and much time has been lost today Yes, wasn't it a shame, said Lucy. I saw you all right. They wouldn't believe me. They're also, from somewhere deep inside Aslan's body, there came the faintest suggestion of a growl. I'm sorry, said Lucy, who understood some of his moods. I didn't mean to start slinging the others, but it wasn't my fault anyway, was it? 
The lines looked straight into her eyes. Oh, Aslan, said Lucy, you don't mean it was. How could I? I couldn't have left the others and come up to you alone. How could I? Don't look at me like that. Oh, well, I suppose I could. Yes, and it wouldn't have been alone, I know, not if I was with you. But what would have been the good? Aslan said nothing. You mean, said Lucy, rather faintly, that it would have turned out all right, somehow? But how? Please, Aslan, am I not to know? To know what would have happened, child, said Aslan. No, nobody has ever told that. Oh dear, said Lucy. But anyone can find out what will happen, said Aslan. If you go back to the others now and wake them up and tell them you have seen me again and that you must all get up at once and follow me, what will happen? There is only one way of finding out. Do you mean that is what you want me to do? Gasped Lucy. Yes, little one, said Aslan. Will the others see you too? Asked Lucy. Certainly not at first, said Aslan. Later on, it depends. But they won't believe me, said Lucy. It doesn't matter, said Aslan. Um, and the quote actually continues, says, uh, Lucy says, oh dear, oh dear, and I was so pleased at finding you again, and I thought you'd let me stay, and I thought you'd come roaring in and frighten all the enemies away, like last time, and now everything is going to be horrid. It is hard for you, little one, said Aslan, but things never happen the same way twice. It has been hard for us all in Narnia before now. Lucy buried her head in his mane to hide from his face, but there must have been magic in his mane. She could feel lion's strength going into her. Quite suddenly, she sat up. I'm sorry, Aslan, she said. I'm ready now. You are a lioness, said Aslan, and now all Narnia will be renewed. But come, we have no time to lose. So I love these situations that Lucy finds herself in. Uh, and, and you do see some of her weaknesses in this passage. She isn't, she isn't flawless. Um, so, and and she's, she's caught up with the fact that um, the things that Aslan's asking her to do, the route he's asking them to take, look like uh, a, a route that would mean suicide to them. Um, that, you know, and that this reminds me of all sorts of times in the Old Testament where God wants the Israelites to do a certain thing and it looks like they would be crazy to do it because they would lose against the nation they're going up against. And um, and little Lucy is the only one that sees Aslan. Everyone else doesn't. And he's telling her these things. And she is being asked to go back to them and say, uh, Aslan told me that this is what we have to do, um, knowing that she's going to look um, silly. And, and she also knows Aslan could come roaring in and show, show them himself and force them to see him. And he doesn't. So, um, so there's this constant sort of emphasis on in the Narnia tales of faith. So, you know, he says, uh, you're, you're not going to know how things are going to work out. Um, you'll, you know how they will in the very end, but you don't know how you'll get from here to there. There's no story that works out the exact same way twice. Um, but there, this really important sort of virtue that he's building in her, because you can see it growing um, slowly, um, which is a lacking, lacking fear of man. Um, that's why he says it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether they believe you or not. And they may see you in time, they may not. And, uh, and I just you know, ask you to think about how hard that is in real life. Um, how, how hard that is in real life to say, um, but God says we should do this, or, or God says we should want this. And uh, knowing full well, sometimes that, so that sounds really ridiculous. Um, it, it sounds weak. It sounds, um, you know, like uh, something that I isn't going to sort of end up getting you all the wealth and the riches, contrary to certain preachers out there who promise that. Um, so, uh, so yeah, um, I, th I think that little Lucy is like actually much stronger than she seems, um, and, and that uh, God uses uh, people like that uh, because He wants them to know it comes not from them. So. Um, so far, moving on, unless there's any comments or questions at this point. Okay. Anyone else, like, when you first read Narnia, were annoyed with Lucy? Am I, like, the only evil person that felt that? Okay. Okay, good. I, I, I'm just glad that I'm not alone. Um, I was just like, she always does it. She always does the right thing. Yeah. Yes. The part where, you know, you said she wasn't perfect, and mm -hmm. I had read them all just mm -hmm. last spring. 
that she uh, is she wants to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's in. Uh, it's one of the but later. Sanity. Yes. yes. Don't yeah. But for a split second, I mean, yeah. it, it doesn't even last that long. Beauty yeah. Short. I know. Wait, yeah. Where was that again? Uh, which Don Treader? Voyage oh, of the Don Treader. Okay. Yeah. I was just trying to place it within. Yeah, that. it's one of the later stories. Yeah. Um, so she does. I think that's that probably would be her greatest moment of weakness. Right. Uh, not not greatest moment. Her lowest moment, but um, greatest moment of weakness. So. But then it still doesn't last that long, yeah. and you know she but probably. There. But it is there. It is there. Yeah. No. And it, it gives me hope that uh, you know. She seemed more real. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Well, and um, I will say there there are people I know that that have this thing she ha she has that have this uh, this mystical, contemplative, trustful, faithful quality. Um, and, and they're sometimes people you underestimate um, because they just seem like too sweet or, uh, you know, and, and you don't think of them as robust uh, and grand. And um, I think of, uh, you know, I have two daughters. One, of my older daughter is very analytical. She's going to be, a, you know, she is already a debater. She came out of the womb debating, um, saying why and no. Um, my second one, uh, she, my second one just reminds me of Lucy. Um, and, and she just, she just, she hears, she hears God talk to her. Um, she, lo she loves hymns. Um, she's seven, but she reads her Bible every morning, you know, on her own. Um, and just uh, has this hope um, in her that uh, astounds, like, Claire and I. Um, we just see it and um, are amazed. And, uh, and I think that Claire, the older one, is always going to seem to, like, seem to know more of what's going on than Annalise, the younger one. Um, like, but, but there's something that, uh, there's a piece that Annalise carries with her uh, that's, that's just, it's something that we, that Claire and I both want. Um, and so I think that these people exist. Um, and, and I, and you know, I think part of the trick is wanting God to make you more like that um, and not be af ashamed of it. Um, not, not think of it as growing weaker. Um, but sort of the more you grow as a person, the more childlike you grow in faith. Um, it just made me think of Martha and Mary. Yeah. You know, Martha yeah. was the practical one. Right. Mary was the wistful one sitting at Jesus' knee, mm -hmm. listening to the stories. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a really, that's a really good example. Yeah, pure in heart. Mm -hmm. um, when the one thing needful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and you wouldn't think of asking Mary to um, plan a giant event for you, you know. Uh, she probably would, you know, who knows how well she would do, probably not very well. Um, Martha would get all, everyone would be invited and RSVP'd and everything, but Mary, uh, Mary could help you see God, you know. Um, so, uh, okay, any other, any other comments before we keep going? So, um, so this next part, you know, I didn't quite know how to uh, how to define it, but this is something that, for me, the Narnia stories have that makes me, to a certain extent, prefer them to the Tolkien stories. And um, I, I, you know, hesitate to say that because I I love the Tolkien stories; they're fantastic. Um, but the um, the Narnia stories have these real, true life um, experiences of what an encounter with God might be. Um, an individual, one-to-one -one, um, en encounter with God. Uh, and um, sort of picture God, uh, or Christ, um, in, in all of his sort of holiness. Um, and, and often these experiences with Aslan, between Aslan and the characters, are ones where it's clear he could crush them. Um, but he also um, could sort of uh, rescue them like better than anyone else could. Um, there's a thing about lions, you know, they, I used to want to just like have a lion that I could sleep with in my bed every night, seriously. I mean, they're just so, um, cut, you know, soft and furry and all of that, but they have claws and they have teeth and they could, they could destroy you. So I think Lewis in some ways picked a good animal um, because, because Christ being meek, um, he also had, um, I mean, if he wanted to, with the power of the Father, he could just, 
you know, just zap someone and they would be gone, you know. Um, so, so looking at our first quote, um, this is from Prince Caspian. Uh, Welcome, Prince. Uh, oh, no, 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 sorry. Uh, this first quote is from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Um, they say Aslan is on the move, perhaps has already landed. And now a very curious thing happened. None of the children knew who Aslan was any more than you do. But the moment the beaver had spoken these words, everyone felt quite different. Perhaps it has sometimes happened to you in a dream that someone says something which you don't understand, but in the dream it feels as if it had some enormous meaning, either a terrifying one which turns the whole dream into a nightmare, or else a lovely meaning too lovely to put into words, which makes the dream so beautiful that you remember it all your life and are always wishing you could get into that dream again. It was like that now. At the name of Aslan, each one of the children felt something jump in its inside. Edmund felt a sensation of mysterious horror. Peter felt suddenly brave and adventurous. Susan felt as if some delicious smell or some delightful strain of music had just floated by her. And Lucy got the feeling you have when you wake up in the morning and realize that it is the beginning of the holidays or the beginning of summer. Um, if you notice in this quote, and I think in almost all the encounters with Aslan, there are two qualities held side by side. Um, one is terrifying. Um, and the other is um, lovely, good, merciful. And, and he almost is never just one or the other, although it depends on the character. Um, so if, if the character, like I said, the, the echo that resounds in the soul sort of uh, reveals um, the, the state of the person in some ways more than it does um, the God that's revealing himself. But if the character is, is running away from what he's supposed to be, then Aslan is pretty much terrifying. Um, but I think even for Lucy, who thinks of him as lovely and good, there still is this awareness, I think, that she keeps all the time of, uh, of the fact that he could do anything he wants. Um, you know, it said that uh, you know he had a low growl at this one in this one conversation when she said something she ought not to or was feeling something she ought not to, and says that she was sort of aware of his moods. So she's she's aware that there is the standard that he's holding her to um, that isn't just like I love you, you can do whatever you want, and I'll just be there. Um, and I think that this is what Lewis thinks of as holiness. Um, it is this combination of these two things. Um, there's another uh, quote. This is, uh, I, I love this one. I painted a, a painting sort of inspired by this. Um, this is a, the scene in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe where Aslan has died. He's been uh, put to death by the White Witch and um, he has resurrected. Um, and it's it's uh, similar to Christ's death and resurrection and Lucy and Susan are seeing him for the first time and um, and he has this sort of uh, running about in the fields with them uh, and it's it's the last thing a person would think you could do with God um, but but Lewis thinks that there's something about Christ that uh, I think cuts against every assumption we think about God's distance from us. Um, and I think he like really wants to push that. That God isn't sort of out there hopefully providentially guiding everything, but that he is, he's closer than anything else. Um, and he's soft and he's good um, and, and he's, he's joy. So, um, so this is the quote and um, I'm gonna read the more extended one. O oh, children, said the lion, I feel my strength coming back to me. O oh, children, catch me if you can. He stood for a second, his eyes very bright, his limbs quivering, lashing himself with his tail. Then he made a leap high over their heads and landed on the other side of the table. Laughing, though she didn't know why, Lucy scrambled over it to reach him. Aslan leaped again. A mad chase began. Round and round the hilltop, he led them, now hopelessly out of their reach, now letting them almost catch his tail, now diving between them, now tossing them in the air with his huge and beautifully velveted paws and catching them again. 
and now stopping unexpectedly so that all three of them rolled over together in a happy laughing heap of fur and arms and legs. It was such a romp as no one has ever had except in Narnia. And whether it was more like playing with a thunderstorm or playing with a kitten, Lucy could never make up her mind. And the funny thing was that when all three finally lay together panting in the sun, the girls no longer felt in the least tired or hungry or thirsty. And then Aslan roars um, after that. He th says, I think I feel something coming upon me. And he lets out this big roar. Uh, and it's, it says, and Aslan stood up. And when he opened his mouth to roar, his face became so terrible, terrifying, that they did not dare to look at it. And they saw all the trees in front of him bend before the blast of his roaring as grass bends in the meadow before the wind. So it's almost like all, all of the... All of the things in creation around bow down to him. But bow down to this creature that they've played with and rolled around with and felt closer to than, than anything else. So I think Lewis is really trying to, to capture this image for children, for adults, um, of, of a God who is, um, is, is you know, uh, all-powerful, someone we bow down to. We take our, our shoes off and you know because we're on holy ground, um, but who welcomes us into his arms um, and and uh, wipes our tears away, um, and and who even uh, can can sort of have joy and, and laugh with us, and and I think that in certain ways uh, a lot of false conceptions of God are, have one but not the other. Yeah. Now this would have something with that at um, Last Supper after washing the feet of the disciples. They say, just let us see the Father. And he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And typically we'll use that to talk about the divinity of Christ. Mm -hmm. The Lord turns it on his head <laughs> and says, they suddenly realize that God is like Jesus. Wow. That God the Father is like Jesus as and opposed to... The <laughs> one who just became your servant. That's, I've already revealed the Father to you. Wow. Wow. That's so good. Because God the Father, we, we almost can be tempted to think of as the, ter the Old Testament God, terrifying one, but um, even, he, even He is both. But, but we only know that through Jesus. Or if we look at sacrifice your son like all the other you know, God, God saved right. you, and their echo chamber is that God wants sacrificial human Yes. And then he says, I'm not like them. Right. And there's this beginning of <laughs> the revelation that we've got the wrong echo chamber going. Right. Wow. No, that's really good. That's really good. Um, there is another scene there's there's two other scenes that I won't um, I won't read tonight but I'll just reference them and I recommend you read them um, one is uh, between the lion and Shasta and the horse and his boy uh, and all through Shasta's adventures in um, in Narnia and even previous to that um, among the Calormines he um, he has these times where uh, he encounters either a cat or a seemingly ferocious lion. Um, sometimes it seems friendly. Sometimes it seems like it's about to eat him. Uh, sometimes it uh, it does chase him uh, as if it's chasing him to death. And he um, encounters Aslan, you know, at the sort of end of his adventures. And Aslan says, um, uh, and, and, you know, and Shasta wonders where he's been all this time. And he says, I was with you um, at each of those moments. I, I was the um, I was the cat uh, that you saw um, in the in the desert when you thought you were alone. I was the lion chasing you because you wouldn't have run as fast if I hadn't been chasing you. Um, and, and even the moments that Shasta was terrified, uh, it, it was Aslan that incited that, but it was for this larger purpose that even he didn't know um, at the time. And so, uh, and, and the other the other really great scene I think that shows this this dual character of God is the undragoning of uh, of is it Eustace? Yeah, of Eustace. Um, so I, I just think that scene is incredible in terms of seeing God as this um, loving, consuming fire. 
um, that that he he loves us so much that he he burns away all in us that is not uh, that is not true um, and, and it hurts um, more than anything else but it, it is the sort of only way in the fullest way to becoming um, our full selves and so this encounter that he has with Aslan in the scene where he's become this dragon um, for because of making bad decisions um, and the dragon scales are dropped off of him it's a it's this painful process but he encounters a um, a terrifying but but lovely and good God uh, who, who would be willing to do this so um, yeah like I said I don't have time to read the scene but I, I definitely recommend looking again at it and just seeing that Lewis he keeps doing this thing with God's nature where he's holding these two ends together um, and he wants it to be real he wants that to make sense um, those two things so uh, the final sort of a uh, couple of parts to the talk um, are just focused on um, the fruits of the Christian imagination so uh, one of the things that's neat in the Narnia stories is that the children is the way time and, and um, age works so uh, in the real world um, the kids who come to visit they'll leave their world and they'll come into the Narnia world and they'll live for years and years and years and they'll grow from children to adults and all these things happen and then um, they go back to their world and maybe only um, a few minutes has passed um, and uh, and so they sort of start they get back to being children again and um, I think that Lewis with this is talking about about the sort of enormous um, sort of uh, expansive growth that happens uh, in sanctification um, that that there's something that sort of works on a completely different time and growth and maturity scale that happens uh, to the Christian believer and the fruits of their imagination that uh, a growth that even even though you've only grown one year older or two years older there's been something enormous that's happened in your soul that um, that you're seeing that people look at and they see the fruits of it in your life uh, and they don't have any other way to explain it um, so this quote um, it also it also sort of in this points back to the echo chamber but the idea that as we grow um, in in our Christian imagination that both we grow bigger um, and God himself grows bigger so um, it says and then, O oh joy, for he was there, the huge lion shining white in the moonlight with his huge black shadow underneath him. But for the movement of his tail, he might have been a stone lion, but Lucy never thought of that. She never stopped to think whether he was a friendly lion or not. She rushed to him. She felt her heart would burst if she lost a moment. And the next thing she knew was that she was kissing him and putting her arms as far around his neck as she could and burying her face in the beautiful, rich silkiness of his mane. Aslan, Aslan, dear Aslan, sobbed Lucy, at last. Welcome, child, he said. Aslan, said Lucy, you're bigger. That is because you are older, little one, answered he. Not because you are? I am not, but every year you grow, you will find me bigger. So what's, what's happening... Um, in in this growth this is this is sort of the fruits of the christian imagination is as you grow not uh, age wise but maturity wise imagination wise your conception of god gets even more um, enlarged i think there's a really great great quote from augustine um, that he he asked god to enlarge the the walls of his heart um, because his heart uh, the walls in it are, are almost lying in ruins. That the it's not that he needs rational arguments, but he needs his imagination and his heart to be expanded. Um, I think that's in Book One, Chapter One of the Confessions, or Chapter Two, actually. Um, so this is this is something similar that is happening to Lucy as she's uh, in Narnia for longer. Aslan himself grows bigger uh, because she she's grown bigger and she's able to see. Um, so last last part um, the call to pursue the depths of the Christian imagination um, this is sort of what what is Lewis asking of us and uh, and I think that we this is kind of like 
when you put down the book after you've read it um, at night and you have to go back to your job um, and back to all the responsibilities and stresses of life, how has reading Narnia changed who you are, what you're going to be, what you're going to do? So this um, comes from the silver chair. It isn't Narnia, you know, sobbed Lucy. It's you. We shan't meet you there, and how can we live never meeting you? So they're going to go back to the real world, and they're not going to remember specifically living in Narnia. Um, and they're, they're going to sort of grow older, and he says that they can never come back. Um, so she just is in despair almost. Um, he says, but you shall meet me, dear one, said Aslan. Are, are you there too, sir, said Edmund. I am, said Aslan, but there I have another name. You must learn to know me by that name. This was the very reason why you were brought to Narnia, that by knowing me here for a little, you may know me better there. So I, th I think this is what Lewis hopes the, the whole Narnia series to be, I think, for um, children and adults that read it, that by knowing him uh, a little, in these books that when we encounter the Lord in our real lives uh, we'll, we'll know him far better. Um, we'll be able to recognize the terrifying and the lovely um, and we'll be able to see the, the times when humility uh, is more important than possessiveness. All these things will sort of, uh, they'll sort of glow. Um, they'll, be, they'll be clear to see. Um, this other quote is great and reminds me of several verses in the Old Testament. Uh, but first, remember, remember, remember the signs. Say them to yourself when you wake in the morning and when you lie down at night and when you wake in the middle of the night. You know, whatever strange things may happen to you, let nothing turn your mind from following the signs. And secondly, I give you a warning. Here in the mountain I have spoken to you clearly. I will not often do so down in Narnia. Here on the mountain, the air is clear and your mind is clear. As you drop down into Narnia, the air will thicken. Take great care that it does not confuse your mind. And the signs which you have learned here will not look at all as you expect them to look when you meet them there. That is why it is so important to know them by heart and pay no attention to appearances. Remember the signs and believe the signs. Nothing else matters. So, uh, it, it, I almost don't. Um, I almost don't need to explain it to a certain extent. I mean, uh, you know, there's certain ways in which uh, I think a child um, carries certain stories in their mind uh, to help them be brave in certain circumstances, um, to help them know what to do in certain circumstances. And uh, I remember when I was uh, little, I read Anna Green Gables and. You know, poor Anne. Uh, she she tries uh, to be, to just be a girl and, and make it, and she fails all the time. Uh, and and you know, people don't always like her. She says really awkward things. And um, I remember I like kind of carried the idea of Anne in my pocket when I went to school. Um, you know, middle school, and I knew I was going to say super awkward things, and people were going to think I was weird because uh, I liked books and um, also sorts of other things and um, it was like carrying around this thing that if I just remembered her and remembered how neat she was even though she was weird um, that I could sort of make it through the day uh, it was like a little sign um, that I could I could carry with me and so I think what Lewis is is doing is he wants these Narnia stories to be to be signs um, that we carry with us that we carry the feelings that they've they've um, awakened in us um, and when we go into the real world or in our day-to-day -day lives we carry them with us and they help awaken um, those exact same relationships to those exact same objects but in this sort of fuller more real way um, not that there's like the escapist life and the real life but that it brings us to know it in this fuller sense here um, so last quote is we're almost out of time this is a uh, Maybe, maybe one of the best ones. This is at the very end of the last book, uh, and they're looking out into uh, the sort of place that they've been longing for um, all of this time. They're finally about to enter it. It is as hard to explain how the sunlit land was different from the old Narnia as it would be to tell you how the fruits of that country taste. Perhaps you will get some idea of it if you think like this. 
You may have been in a room in which there was a window that looked out on a lovely bay of the sea or a green valley that wound away among mountains. And in the wall of that room opposite to the window, there may have been a looking glass. And as you turned away from the window, you suddenly caught sight of that sea or that valley all over again in the looking glass. And the sea in the mirror or the valley in the mirror were in one sense just the same as the real ones, yet at the same time they were somehow different, deeper, more wonderful, more like places in a story, in a story you have never heard but very much want to know. The difference between the old Narnia and the new Narnia was like that. The new one was a deeper country. Every rock and flower and blade of grass looked as if it meant more. And so, uh, oh, I have come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I have been looking for all my life, though I never knew it till now. Come further up, come further in. Um, I couldn't help but uh, connect that with this verse from Hebrews um, 11, 13 through 16. Um, Paul says, the saints died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to, call, to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. So, thank you very much.